when Subway broke the universe. This happened on June 18, 1993, in Princeton, Iowa. It was the day before my younger sister's wedding. The day was warm, clear, and beautiful. My mom and I had exactly nothing to do that day, save for one job. We had to pick up my sister's wedding dress between 3 and 3.30 from the seamstress's house in a town that was about an hour's drive away. This task was, of course, super important to my sister and I, but it was also super important to the seamstress because she was going to leave for the airport at 3.30. My mom and I planned our day around this one simple task. There were relatives coming from out of town, and we'd already prepared my mom's house and RV for the guests. My sister was running errands, my kids were with my brother, and everyone else was gone. So on this day, it was just my mom and I with basically not much to do. At 10 a.m., we decided to open up the RV, which was parked in mom's driveway, to air it out and double-check that it was ready. We went out there, opened the windows, and dusted a few things. After that, we decided we'd go get an early lunch, bring it back to the RV to eat, and then leave to pick up the dress at 1.30. So, at 10.50, we drove to the local subway. The drive was short, and we got there a few minutes before they opened at 11. They were still opening when we went in, taking the lids off the veggies and stuff like that. We were the first and only customers there, and both ordered salads and iced tea. The salads were crisp and cold, and we got our cold drinks in the paper-style cups. By 11.10, we were back in the RV and dug into our lunch. Right as we popped the tops off the salad, Mom told me she'd gotten a Neil Diamond album for later that evening, so she and the older folks could rock out. This cracked us both up, and while we were laughing, my mom glanced at her watch. She looked confused and asked me what time it was. I looked at my watch, and it said 2.15. Surely this wasn't right? Mom said her watch said 2.15 also. We both looked down on our salads, which we barely touched. Our cups of tea hadn't even had time to sweat in the heat of the June day. My mom picked up her bowl of salad and said, It's still cold. I felt mine, and it was too. The paper cups didn't show any signs of leakage like paper cups will after holding liquid for a few hours. We decided there had to be a mistake. Surely both our watches were acting up. There was no way we'd been sitting there for three hours. We'd only taken a few bites, and the salads were still crisp and not gunky and limp like when salad sits out. Neither of us had even taken a drink of our tea. Either way, we packed up our still-cold salads, picked up our still-cold, non-sweaty drinks, and went into the house. Every clock said 2.15. It was unbelievable. We were still not convinced, so we called time and temperature to make sure. The recording said it was 2.15 p.m. Neither of us believed it, so we called it back, and again it was 2.15 p.m. We were still very uncertain that it was really that late in the day, but we put everything in the fridge and left to get the dress. The car clock said 2.16. During the drive, we tried to figure out what had happened, but had no explanation. Due to heavy traffic, we were ten minutes late. By the time we got there, the seamstress was getting in her car to leave. She'd already called my sister to complain. We talked the seamstress into letting us pick up the dress. She was angry about it, but relented, and had us follow her back into her house. We had to call my sister from the seamstress's house phone to assure her we were there. Then we had to listen to the seamstress tell us we nearly ruined her vacation. Finally, we got the dress and walked out the door with the seamstress rushing out behind us to catch her plane. We got out of there and back to my mom's where my sister was waiting. She wasn't as upset as she was relieved that we'd gotten the dress. We told her our story, and she was as baffled as we were. We did eat the salads later, and the paper cups did get squishy from the liquid. We still wonder how we lost three hours, and my sister still teases us about how we had one job. Paul, as someone whose one job at his wedding was to order the taxi cab for the family and forgot to do that, I feel targeted by that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't take it personally. I think my family took it personally when the cab didn't come get them and the uh, guy who owned the cabin's Range Rover had to take them. The Range Rover encrusted with mud and shit. <laughs> yeah, I was Welcome very to Cornwall. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, you're lucky you didn't send the hairy hands to come and get them. I mean, that might have been faster. Who knows? Maybe my mother-in-law could have met someone. <laughs> None of my family listened to the show, so I can say that. <laughs> So 
So I, I looked up Princeton because, again, I, I don't know much about Iowa. I've never actually been. The closest I came was uh, when I went to that wedding in Minneapolis in 2017 with Mike. And we were we were actually going to drive to Iowa just to say we did. And then we I think we got part of the way there. We ran out of time. So I, I looked up Princeton. And the only thing I found is they used to have this very popular haunted farm attraction, which was like one of those big farms where they have a corn maze and all that shit. And uh, it was called the um, Haunted Carter Farm. And the, the, the most notable thing I, I found there is, and, and I sort of assume this is what killed it, one of the Endless Children of the Corn remakes was shot there. Mm. And I figure if anything is going to cast a pall over a place, it's that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think Iowa is one of those states that it's got two or three uh, terrifying real stories attached to it. So um, everything else seems to pale into insignificance in comparison with some of those. Do, do we get any of them yet or do we have to wait? Well, yeah, I'm more than happy to share uh, the the infamous Valeska House murders. Oh, of course. Yeah, you know, way back in the early days of the show, I was going to do an episode on that before we kind of went to the stories format. Mm. I remember I wanted to call it, uh, it's not delivery, it's Velisca. Mm. If I had done that episode, that's, that would have been the title. Yeah. It's uh, one of the great strange things that I've learned doing Mysteries and Monsters in this show. It's the amount of axe murders that occurred in the early part of the 20th century, particularly in the northern United States. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah, you were never talking about this, man. When, when, those, when folks back in those days wanted things dead, they had to work for it. Oh. So you 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 really, really had to want to kill someone. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd I'd never heard of it, and then uh, the ladies on Morbid did it and covered the case, and I was just it because it's an unsolved murder. Nobody was ever convicted for it. Six, I think six people, including children, were murdered by axe. So you've got to you've got to work on the principle of, you know. If you're hitting somebody with an axe, there's a good chance one of them will will come round after a whack, at the very least, and scream. So how none of the others heard it and they were able to move around the house, because they said it was like somebody had moved around the house silently and killed them all, because I think they were all, I think most of them were killed in their beds. And they're not typically a silent weapon, the axe. You don't see Splinter Cell out there using hatchets to uh, off insurgents. No, it's uh, it's such a strange, strange story. It's one of those that makes you just scratch your head. I know when I've spoken to Chad Lewis, there's one that he covered in one of his books, which um, is another one, but that's another true story where a mother killed all the children and then tried to drown herself, and um, she was rescued but passed away fairly quickly um, for her husband because uh, her husband was going to leave her or something, and so she wanted to to exact the ultimate revenge. My and, God. And, and killed all, all their children. I think they had six or seven kids. She killed them all. Um, and then, I think, did she set fire to the house? It's, it's, we covered it on, on one of my ep episodes with Chad. I'll have to check it. But um, it's a horrific story. It's on a stretch of road called M M the Mur Murder Curve, I think it's called. Um, I feel like it's a little bit of determinism happening there. I mean, I would probably not buy that house. <laughs> or was it called that afterwards? I think it's it's got the name afterwards. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I just imagine got... the cops turning up and going, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> finally. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Valeska is one of those very, very, very strange cases that um, just, it's just weird. And obviously since since the murder, the house has now become a reputation as one of the most haunted locations because the original house is still standing. Oh, wow, okay. Both parents, Josiah and Sarah, and their children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd and Paul. Oh, there were eight people killed. Jesus so those, Christ. Both parents, four children, and two family friends who were stopping there, all were killed in their bed. Beds. Terrifying. Uh, and the axe was left in the room where the two daughters were sleep. Well, were sleeping. Nobody was ever caught. There was no... Nobody had any idea who could have done it and why they could have done it. It just di didn't make sense. There was stories and rumours about reasons, but there was nothing concrete. Paul, well, now I, I don't know. Uh, again, the true, uh, you're sort of the uh, the repository of knowledge on this show. Um, isn't that how the DeFeo murders happened? Well, he went round and shot them all in bed. 
Yeah, but but it was this kind of situation where you would think someone Somebody would hear would this. Wake up. Yeah. Well, that's why there are theories that okay. Ronald didn't do it on his own. Right. Because um, I think six, when he, he killed every other member of his family, didn't he? I believe so, yeah. Both parents, and they were all shot in bed. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I think they suggested that he may have drugged the family. Oh, OK. But I'm not sure if they ever conclusively proved that. I'm not sure if the autopsies proved that they'd had sleeping tablets or something. Um, but thankfully, after, after that, nothing's been connected with Amityville ever. So... Um, no, you know, after after the murder, it it seems to have just settled down into a normal house, and in in no way has a work of fiction been built around it in the forty five no. years since. No, are you, you? No, it's not like some some unscrupulous scam artist dirtbags made up a legend that has endured as one of the most popular paranormal franchises. No, yo oh, man. Next, you're gonna tell me that there's a a couple of creeps who have become famous. For the last 40 years for fighting demons even though they were admitted con artists and he yes. creeped on a teenage girl but uh no that wouldn't happen you know <laughs> oh god yeah. imagine if it had though what a terrible industry we would be part of i mean god god forbid they had a court case where it was proven that it was it was a dreamt at work of fiction no it's one of the few cases i've got time for joe nichols skeptical destruction of the story, actually. The Lutzes? Mm. Oh, yeah. Because Nick will even check the weather reports to prove that what, none of the stuff could have happened on, you know, like he was saying, that footprints were left in the snow. Did snow. Yeah. Oh, God. I, mm. Paul, I remember, I think one of my favorite episodes I did from the, like, the old show uh, was episode, oh, fuck, what was it? 13 or 14, it's called If It Ain't Haunted, Don't Fix It. Mm-hmm. And I kind of did that. I went and just found a bunch of sh things that don't make sense. And one of them was, was Amityville. Mm. And, and that was six years ago. And I, I'm, I mean, admittedly, of course, this has been going on for, what, 30, 40 years. But mm. six years ago, I did a show on this is bullshit. Look, this is bullshit. They admitted this is bullshit. And you still can't swing a cat without hitting some jackass who wants to talk about the terrible haunting of the Amityville house. It makes me sad. Just because people, they know there's SEO there. They know that people will click it because they recognize the name and they just are a bunch of ghouls desperate for some kind of fame and so they'll they'll pull whatever out of their ass they want. Hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It's um it's frustrating because every every claim that Lutz can provide can be disproved. There is no supporting evidence whatsoever. The only person that ever that's ever agreed to him, ironically, is the son that charges money to be interviewed. Sure. I'm sure there's no correlation between those two things. No, 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 no. Oh, I've wasted too much of my life on Amityville already. Yep. Yep, and we've wasted too much of this tele of television show. We've wasted too much of this podcast talking what happened to Bill already. But yes. I will say, nothing makes me happier than shitting on fraudsters, Paul. Because the thing that pisses me off, and this is the last thing we'll say, then we'll move on to the next story. The paranormal's real. Shit's happening. Something's fucking yeah. happening. We don't have to make things up. We don't have to lie. We don't have to make it theatrical. We don't have to come up with a bullshit Twitter thread that gets turned into a movie. This shit is happening. It's happening all the time, all around us. We're bathed in it. So there's no need to make things up. No, no, no. And there are far better cases. 